بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so as we had promised you today we're going to do a brief overview of zakat uh, and inshallah you'll be getting some handouts as well uh, they, they should have been photocopied and be ready for you um, obviously this is going to be a short introduction we cannot give a detailed lecture uh, about zakat but it's going to be a, a brief overview inshallah ta'ala uh, zakat as we all know is one of the fundamental pillars of our religion it is next to the salah in its importance. In more than 30 verses, Allah Azza wa Jal commands us to pray and give zakah. Zakah has been linked to the salah. So much so that when Allah Azza wa Jal told the pagans of Mecca that they are najis, innam al mushikun al najis, Allah said to the Muslims, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ If they repent from their shirk, and they start praying and giving zakat, then they will become your brothers in Islam. And therefore, those who refuse to give zakat, according to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, what was his verdict on those who did not give zakat? He said they are not Muslims. He said they are not Muslims. You all know the story that, that after the Prophet Wasallam passed away, groups of tribes said, you know what? We will pray, we'll do what you want, but we're not going to give you our money. We're not going to give you zakat. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Wallahi la'uqatilanna man farraqa bayna salati wa zakah. That I will fight against all those who differentiate between salah and zakah. So he considered zakah to be not nafil, not just a luxury. He said it is a part and parcel of being a Muslim. It is a requirement of being a Muslim. Now, zakat, Allah mentions in the Quran, the primary wisdom of zakah. خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ بِهَا That take from their money the zakah so that they can purify themselves. وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا تُطَهِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا So the purpose of zakah, we need to understand this. The number one reason why Allah legislated zakah is so that our money will be pure for us. Allah doesn't need our money. It's not even for the poor people. No. We need to think about this when we give zakah. That Allah is saying by giving zakat, our money will be pure for us. Otherwise, our money is filthy for us. And in fact, this is the actual meaning of zakat. What does zakat mean? Zakat means to purify, right? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Zakat means to purify. So when we give zakat, we purify our money. Now, we need to understand Allah in His mercy put a small percentage on our wealth, not like any government that has 20, 30, 40 percent, some governments in Europe have almost 50 percent of tax on income. Allah Azza wa Jal does not have income tax. Allah has, I'm being very generic here, savings tax. We are not taxed on our income. We are taxed on how much we save at the end of the year. So all of the expenses that we have for ourselves and our families that we don't save till the end of the year, this will not be zakatable. It's not going to have any zakat on it. Therefore, it is more of an aggregation tax. It's more of an accumulation tax and not an income tax. And it is possible that a person earns $200,000, $300,000, another earns $100,000, but because of their personal expenses, the one who's earning three hundred, dollars he lives a little bit better lifestyle, he has a larger family, it is possible their zakat might be similar. Because the sharia taxes according to aggregation of wealth, not according to actual income. Now, who gives zakat? Every Muslim who owns more than the nisab for one lunar year. This is what is required. Who gives zakat? If you're a Muslim who owns more than the nisab, the nisab is the minimum amount that the sharia has set. For more than one lunar year, you must give zakat. And pretty much, I, I would assume everybody sitting here would have more than the nisab, as we will discuss soon, inshallah ta'ala. What types of wealth are zakatable? What do you put zakat on? The sharia has four categories. We're only going to discuss two of them, because the other two, by and large, are not relevant to uh, most of us here. Four categories of income, of wealth, are worthy of zakat. Number one, gold and silver. Gold and silver, and by extension, currency. Because currency in our times takes the place and takes the ruling of gold and silver. So dollars, euros, pesas, rupees, whatever it is, currencies, gold and silver, that's the first category. Number two, business commodities. And we'll explain all of these two, business commodities. By extension, of course, uh, 
any items that a merchant will buy and sell, any stock that the stock owner, shop owner has, this is business commodities, right? By stock, I don't mean stock of the, 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 the fund and the trading stock. I mean stock meaning what your physical warehouse has in stock, right? If you are buying and selling furniture, the stock in your furniture warehouse, this is what I mean by stock. So this is the second category of zakat, and that is uh, business merchandise, business commodities. The third uh, category of zakat is livestock. And because most of us here uh, don't own sheep and goats, some of us I know do, alhamdulillah, but not everybody owns sheep and goats over here. Uh, because we don't, most of us don't, we're not going to talk about zakat on uh, livestock. If you own livestock, then come see me or go talk to a sheikh. That's a separate type of zakat. And the fourth that we're not going to discuss as well is agricultural produce. If you own date farms or whatnot, then there's a separate tax or zakat on that. We're not going to discuss those two. Uh, livestock and agricultural products, we're not going to discuss in the short uh, um, overview. So, what is the nisab? The Prophet ﷺ said that 20 mithqals of gold and uh, 200 uqiyya of silver, that's when you translate this into modern, you get roughly 85 grams of gold and 595 grams of silver is the nisab. Now, once upon a time, everybody had only gold and silver in terms of currencies, right? And therefore, if a person had, let's say, 500 uh, um, uh, uh, dinars of gold, he would give 2.5%, no problem. In our times, of course, we get the issue of, well, hardly anybody has gold and silver, we have currency. And so which of the nisab should we use for currency? Because there's a big difference. If you look at the nisab of gold, 85 grams of gold, if you do the math, I did it today a few hours ago uh, from Kitco, you can log on to Kitco and do it yourself, uh, you get around $4,760 is the nisab of gold. And the nisab of silver is around $577, there's a big difference. Once upon a time, that much gold and silver was similar to each other in price. And the Prophet said the nisab, explicitly he said the nisab, this much gold, this much silver. Over the last 14 centuries, the, the disparity between gold and silver has, especially the last five years, as, as you know, gold has gone off the charts. And therefore the prices are different, the nisab of gold therefore is around 5,000. And the nisab of silver is around 500, a difference of 10 factor. So what do we do? Scholars of our time say that we look at the nisab of gold only for gold. You look at how much gold you have. If you have more than $4,760 worth of gold, then you give zakat on the gold as a separate zakat. Then you look at the rest of your wealth. Money, euros, dollars, pesas, rupees, whatever you have. Currency we're talking about, right? And the nisab of currencies according to the majority position. And this is the position of the Fiqh Council of Mecca, the majority of Fiqh Councils around the world, the World Fiqh Council of, uh, of the Rabit al-Alam al-Islami. They said we look at the nisab of silver. Why? Because they said silver is much less and we want to give money to the poor. So we go with the lesser so that we give money to the poor. So we look at the nisab of silver for our currencies. If your bank account has more than $577 as of today, and you've had this amount for a year, then you are worthy of giving zakat. Clear? Right? So the nisab in terms of money is 577 as worked out today, dollars. Of course, this will change day to day, but the price of silver is pretty steady. It's not going up and down like gold. So once again, gold and silver as actual coins, as actual bullion, as actual jewelry, you will give zakat very simply calculated this way, 595 grams of silver, 85 grams of gold. Now, if you have gold that your wife uses, uh, uh, or you have silver uh, that is stored as jewelry or whatnot, the strongest position of the scholars, and this leads me to a disclaimer, that because it is a short seminar, I will have to simply go with the strongest position according to me really. There's really no way around it. I'm teaching you, so obviously I'll give you according to what I believe is the strongest. There's always a diversity of opinion. Uh, and if you want to go to other scholars, that's fine. That's your prerogative to do so. In my humble opinion, and this is the fatwa from the bulk of scholars that I have studied with as well, that gold and silver, regardless of what it is used for, you must give zakat on it. If your wife has gold bangles, she has gold bracelets, right? You have a silver pen. Whatever is gold and silver, then you must give zakat on it. If you have gold coins, if you have silver coins, all of this is uh, something that you must give zakat on. Now, what you give zakat on is the price of gold. And uh, if you have 24 karat gold, which is very rare, 
uh, then alhamdulillah that's easy to calculate. If it's less than that, you should go to a jeweler as long as it's 12 carat or more. You don't, you don't really get gold for less than 12 carat and gold plating and silver plating, really there's no zakat on that because that's just one layer uh, on top of whatever is there. Gold plated and silver plated, there is no zakat to give. That's not really uh, money to give zakat on. Anything that is more than 12 carat, so 17 carat, 18 carat, 22 carat, you need to go to a, a, a jeweler and get a rough estimate. What is the value of the gold? Because the zakat is on the gold, not on other precious metals. So your wife has a diamond necklace that has the gold, uh, the, the actual necklace is gold and then there's a diamond on it. Or there's a, a ruby, there's a pearl. There is no zakat on precious stones. The zakat is on the gold only. Anything that is precious stones that you use for decoration, your wife uses for decoration, there is no zakat on that. So you need to go to a jeweler and calculate what is the value of the gold. And what you should do is ask the jeweler to write down what is the grams and the carats of the gold so that you can recalculate every year. He might give you a value this year. Let's say you have, mashallah, $5,000 worth of gold this year. Next year, the gold value goes up. It will actually go up to 10,000. You don't know, you have 5,000 written down. The best thing to do is to tell the jeweler, give me the actual grams of gold and give me the carats as well. And that way you can then figure out as the price varies, 18 karat gold, what is it worth? 20 karat gold, what is it worth per gram? Then you can calculate every single year by simply multiplying uh, the value of the gold by 2.5%. So. The gold that you have, if it's $5,000, you simply multiply that by 2.5% and you give zakat uh, according to that. The zakat on liquid assets, i.e. currencies, bank accounts. There is a very difficult way to do this. If we had time, we would do go over that. But our scholars of our times have given a very simple method. And this is also the fatwa from the World Fiqh Council of Mecca. You should know, by the way, all of you uh, should be aware that the most authoritative body in the Sunni world for fiqh is the World Fiqh Council of Mecca. This is a part of Rabit al-Alam al-Islami or the Organization of Islamic Conference. They have chosen scholars from across the world, Mauritania, India, Pakistan, Arabia. Uh, they represent the bulk of the Muslim world and they have uh, an annual conference uh, in Mecca every single year to discuss modern issues. And this is called the, uh, uh, the, the Rabat al-Alam al-Islami's Fiqh Council. And this is really, in my humble opinion, this is the pulse of the Ummah. This is the mainstream of the Ummah and the, their fatawa are respected across the board. And generally most of what I'm telling you today is something that they have also sanctioned. So what they have said, to make things easy for the people, this is what you do, very simple. You all should have a date that you give zakat on, 15th Ramadan, let's say. And by the way, it must be a Shijri date. A lot of people make the big mistake of putting a Gregorian date, the 15th of August. No, zakat is due according to Islamic year, not according to Western year. So you need to choose a date of the whole year that you give your zakat on. And Ramadan is the best time to give zakat because you get extra reward. So suppose 15th Ramadan, 20th Ramadan, 27th Ramadan, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That is your year, that is your day. Now that it is fixed every year, you give zakat on that day. So what the World Fiqh Council has said, what, the, what the, the modern position is, that on that day, 15th of Ramadan, let's say, you simply look at your liquid assets. You look at all of your bank accounts and simply consider that to have been the amount that you give zakat on to make life easy. As long as it's above the nisab, I think pretty much all of us would have more than $500 in our bank accounts put together. As long as it's above the, the nisab of silver, whatever is available on that day, you just give zakat on that. All of the bank accounts put together that you have, you can consider that to be your liquid assets, multiply that by 2.5% and that gives you the zakat on your currency, on your money. Of course, not just bank accounts. If you have a stack of cash under your pillow, then this also counts as cash, right? If you have it in your freezer, wherever you put your cash, right? All of the cash, I mean, all of the liquid currencies, obviously regardless of what currency you have it in, right? Euros, dollars, pesos, it doesn't matter. All of this put together will be zakatable at 2.5%. The cumulative, you don't have to give it in each currency. Suppose you have uh, 100,000 rupees in a bank account in Pakistan or India, right? You can calculate how much rupees that will be today, right? Uh, and then how much, sorry, how much the dollar equivalent will that will be today and then give that dollar amount. You don't have to give it in rupees. As long as it is the same uh, day that you give zakat. 
So what is the currency exchange on that day? The 15th of Ramadan. Then you will give zakat according to the currency exchange of that day. So this is zakat on liquid assets. Question arises, do I give zakat on non, uh, um, other items that I own, non-liquid assets? My car, my furniture, I have two cars. Do I give zakat on both cars or the, the car that is surplus? The response, the sharia is so merciful. All of your personal items are exempt from zakat. Your personal items, i.e. something that you use for yourself or your family. This is not business items, right? Even if it is a luxury car that you use once in a while, but it's not a car that you're buying and selling. That's a separate category. Anything that you use yourself, your clothes, your watches, your pens, all of your personal, your furniture, all of that is exempt from zakah with the condition it is your personal use. What other category can exist? Buying and selling. If you buy something in order to sell it later on, this is not your personal use, right? Then that's a separate category. We'll talk about that in a different uh, section over here. And that is a zakat on business commodities. What is a business commodity? By business commodities, I mean anything that you have the intention of buying and selling. So every one of you who is a businessman, who owns a shop, gas station owners, furniture store, car salesmen, you have a car lot, you have 20 cars. Obviously cars come in and out every single day, right? And the sharia once again is very lax in this regard. Allah doesn't want to make life difficult. Allah Azza wa Jal has said that on the day, and this is taken from the Quran, وَآتُ حَقَّهُ يَوْمَ حَصَادِهِ Give it its due on the day that you harvested, by qiyas, by extension, the scholars have said, give the zakat on the day that you every year give your zakat on. What do I mean by this? Let me give you the example of the car salesman. Now it is possible that two months ago he would have had a hundred cars in his lot. And mashallah, somebody came and purchased 50 of them before Ramadan. So from 100, he goes down to 50. Perhaps the average number of cars in his lot is 70. But it just so happened that come 15th of Ramadan, instead of having an average of 70, he has 50. The Sharia says, as long as he didn't trick or intend or to get around zakat, as long as this is what happened beyond his control, whatever is the value of his merchandise on that day, he shall give 2.5% of that and he, that is his business zakat. It's the same goes for the petrol shop owner. So he has a, a petrol shop. The day that the 15th of Ramadan, how much gas is stored underneath the, in the chambers that the store the gas? How much gasoline is stored? What about the merchandise that he sells? All of the candies and all of the chips and the packets. All of this he will make a rough estimation. Obviously Allah doesn't want you to go and count every single M&M's wrapper, obviously, right? You make a rough estimation that how much roughly is worth this stock? And then you give 2.5% of that. Now, now this works both ways. Suppose he has an average of 70 cars. It just so happened that business was slow. He has 150 cars in his lot. Well then this is, this is the law. That he must give zakat on 150 cars. What is the value of 150? What he expects to be fair market value. We would go, let's say the, the book value, the, the blue book, right? We would go by this. Now it is possible that the car will sell for twice that price if he finds somebody to purchase it. It is possible it will go for less. But he needs to give the fair market value. Furniture store owner, same thing. That this furniture item, it should sell for 700. If he's lucky, he'll get 750. Doesn't matter. If it should sell for 700, then he will give zakat on 700 times 2.5% for that item. Now by the way, this isn't just business owners. Suppose I have a second land that I want to sell. I have a house on the market. I become a businessman now. I become a businessman now because I'm buying and selling something. So the buying, buyer and seller, any businessman, any trade and transaction, the, the, the point is if you have the niyyah of selling an item and it is being advertised. Now when I say niyyah of selling, I mean in the near future. Many of us, we have let's say a plot of land, we just are investing in it till 15, 20 years, our kids graduation, when our daughter gets married, that's not, the niyyah is not there to sell right now. That's really an investment, we'll get to investments later. I'm talking about it is on the market, it's being advertised. The car salesman, he's advertising, I'm a car salesman, come and buy. That person needs to give 2.5% of the fair market value of all that he owns. The same applies if I just want to sell a piece of land and it's being advertised. I'm not a businessman, but at this, in this case, I become a businessman. And therefore the Sharia says the fair market value. Now, 
Somebody will say, shouldn't he then sell it beforehand so that he gets out of the zakah? Well, realize if he were to sell it, where will the money go? In his bank account. So he will give the zakat from the currency. So it works out to be the same, 2.5%, right? Because that's the whole point that you have this aggregate wealth that you are, that is your ownership, you will give zakat on it, regardless of whether it is in liquid currency or it is in solid capital. So zakat on business commodities, uh, also, by the way, the wholesaler will calculate the wholesale price, the retailer will calculate the retail price. Okay, common sense. Whatever price the wholesaler sells at wholesale price, why should he calculate the zakat of the retail? He will calculate the zakat based upon the wholesale price. Now, suppose you own a house that you're giving out for rent. You're not selling the house, you're renting it to somebody else. You own a second house, somebody's renting it. In this case, you must give zakat on the income at the end of the year in your bank account that comes from the rent and not on the price of the house because you're not selling the house, right? Is that clear? A rental property, you're not selling it, you're renting it. So the money that you get from the rent will go to your bank account. Therefore, what is zakatable is the money that will be in your bank account come the day that you give zakat. The minute that you decide to sell the house, you put a for sale sign, and it so happens that 15th of Ramadan comes, then you will give zakat on, on what? On the value of the house, right? Because it has transferred from a rental property to a business commodity. Is that clear, right? Uh, moving on. How about stocks? Now when I say stocks, now I mean stocks, mutual fund stocks, right? Fidelity uh, and, uh, and venture capital. What, what if you have stocks? What if you have mutual funds? There is a huge controversy here, and uh, last year I gave a more detailed class, and this year I did some more research, and I, last year I gave the fatwa of Sheikh Qardawi. And as you all know, Sheikh Qardawi is perhaps the senior most cleric alive in our religion today. May Allah Azza wa give him more barakah in his life. He has a fatwa, I will not repeat it now, I gave that last year. More research, and uh, this year I did a little bit more research, and I am now giving you the fatwa from the World Fiqh Council. Right, which is what I just said, the mainstream if you like, or a, a greater authoritative body. So this is a slightly different fatwa than maybe those of you who attended my last year's class. That world body, that council has said, and this is a little bit confusing so pay attention. When it comes to stocks and mutual funds, we look at what is the intention behind buying those stocks and mutual funds. What is your intention? Is your intention for long-term investment, you want to save it for a rainy day, it's your college fund for your kid, right? It's your retirement fund, you're just saving it for a rainy day. In this case, according to uh, the OIC's fiqh body, zakat is given not on the value of the stock, but on the dividends that come. The profit that you get, then you will give zakat on that. Right? So suppose you had $100,000 invested. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, this is definitely not this year or the last three years, but let's say 10 years ago, MashaAllah, tabarakallah, the stock market went up. You got 10, 15, 20,000 dollars, right? Seven, eight years ago, you could have gotten 20,000 would have been even doable if you invested in the right stocks, right? So the zakat will be the 20,000 dividends times 2.5%. Okay? Not the 100,000 value of the stock. Why? Because According to the, the Fiqh Council, this stock is like a second house or a, or a property that you're just keeping for some future date. You're not intending to sell it right now. Okay? Now, suppose you are, mashallah, tabarakallah, dynamic young man, you're a stockbroker, you want to take risks, you're buying and selling, you're monitoring every two minutes, three minutes if the stock goes up and down, right? You just want to buy this, sell that. Suppose you're into, into the stock market in that manner, right? In this case, the scholars have said, your stock is basically your business merchandise, like the car salesman, like the furniture store guy. You're buying and selling according to the value, according to the market price. So, if your niya is short-term investment, 
right? You're an aggressive person in terms of stock market, not in terms of character, right? You're an aggressive buyer and seller, you're monitoring, you're going this and that. Every, if, if it goes up a quarter percent, khalas, you'll sell it, buy another one, goes up another half, alhamdulillah, you thank Allah, you move on. If you're that type of person, and by short term, you all know what short term is, I don't necessarily mean the same day, but basically a few weeks, a few months, you just want to buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. Then in this case, the stocks take the verdict of business commodities. And what is the zakat on business commodities? The value of the entire commodity on the day that you give zakat. And therefore, in this case, if your stock is valued at $100,000 on 15th of Ramadan, you will pay zakat on 2.5% of $100,000. Because stock for you has now become just like the car salesman, just like the furniture salesman. Is that clear? Right? And so according to this fatwa, the fatwa I gave last year was Sheikh Qardawi, which he gave back in the 60s, and I don't know if he still even holds that fatwa. And I thought a lot about it. I spoke to many scholars in the last few days as well to make sure that I'm teaching you something that is mainstream. And it seems that those people who research more in this, Sheikh Qardawi, rahimahullah, he gave the fatwa back in the 60s. And it was still a new thing. Uh, the OIC, the Islamic Conference, has given the fatwa only a few years ago after extensive research. And it really makes sense that you differentiate between long-term and short-term, right? Long-term investments, you, you will pay the zakat when you get the money from them. When you sell the land after 20 years, then you will pay the zakat on that money. Otherwise, if the land is just sitting there and you're not advertising it to, to be sold, then there is no zakat on the land, right? If you own a second house, let's say, whether it's empty, whether it's not, you don't pay zakat on the second house until you put the sign for sale. You guys following me, right? So based on this fatwa, long-term investments are not zakatable as long as you don't intend to sell them. When you sell them, then the money will become the, the, the zakatable income. Therefore, we now understand, those who attended last year will hear a different fatwa, 401ks, right? They will have the same ruling. That there is no zakat to be given on them until they are cashed out. Until you actually sell them and get the money. Okay, now last year I gave the fatwa of Sheikh Qardawi, so don't get angry at me. This was Qardawi's fatwa, and inshallah Allah will reward you. Alhamdulillah, good. Okay, extra reward. But this year, uh, after some research and whatnot, and talking to a lot of people back and forth, uh, Allah knows best, but this fatwa makes sense to me now. That 401ks, because it is long term, because you're not cashing out, you want to you wanna take it when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, then you give zakat when you cash out on it. When you get it all back. That is when you will give zakat on it. When you actually have full possession. Otherwise, it will be considered to be a type of weak debt. It's not in your possession. You're just handing it over to a third party. And you don't actually have full ownership over it. It's partial ownership. It's not full ownership. And therefore, there is no zakat on 401ks according to that fatwa. Who should zakat be given to? This is where it gets very tricky. SubhanAllah, it's so easy to give the theory, but the reality is very difficult. The theory says, by the way, uh, Surah Tawbah verse 60 gives us eight categories of recipients of zakat. Very frankly speaking, six of them are not relevant to us in North America by and large. Six of them are something that are not relevant to us, any yani slaves, and this is not something that freeing slaves and stuff, fi sabilillah, this is not something relevant to us. So for us, it really boils down to two categories, fuqara and masakin, and for our perspectives, they really are the same, faqir and miskin. The sharia has a slight difference between the two. Uh, the faqir is somebody who does not own any uh, property. So for example, the homeless person. For example, yani somebody who really does not have anything, and doesn't even have a roof over his head. This is the faqir. The miskeen is somebody who owns property, but not enough for him to live a, uh, a, a meaningful life, or a moderate life, right? Now, technically speaking, this is where it gets tricky. Technically speaking, speaking, zakat needs to be given to those who have less than the nisab. This is common sense, because how can you give zakah from one hand and receive it from the other hand? Right? Technically speaking, zakat should be given to those who don't have enough in the nisab. The problem comes that the nisab of silver is so minuscule in our times, and that's $570, that 
Subhanallah, many are the people, right, who have more than $570 for the year, but they are struggling. Now, the way out is very easy, and that is that the Sharia takes debts into account. So suppose he has, mashallah, $5,000 in his bank account, but he owes $50,000 to a credit company, to this, to that, to friends, to extended family. Therefore, in reality, he's in, in negative $45,000. Right? So the Sharia looks at debts in this regard, in this case. And a person who is struggling financially generally is going to be in debt. And therefore you can give zakat to such people without any, uh, without any problem. As for those who might not be in debt but they have more than 570, subhanAllah this is where it's a gray area. In my humble opinion, if you uh, see that this person is in need, that he's having trouble paying his bills, that he cannot live a comfortable life, according to the standards of our time. So what is comfortable in America is different than what is comfortable in India and Pakistan. So according to the standards of our times, uh, they has to have a roof over his head. The AC bill has to be paid. Many lands in the world, AC is a luxury. Many lands in the world, if you don't have AC, you can live without AC, even though the temperature is hotter over there than it is here, right? But in America, not having AC, you really are considered to be below the poverty line. So we, we take into account what the Sharia calls urf, or local customs and culture. So we look at, for example, having a car uh, is really a necessity in North America. You cannot live really with great difficulty if you don't have a car. So we look at the general uh, trend or the general standard of living and we pass a verdict accordingly. And therefore, if you do find a family that has more than the nisab, but they are still struggling, insha'Allah ta'ala, it is permitted to give them zakat. In which case, technically, they will give zakat, but they will give a small amount. 2.5% of, let's say, $1,000, $25, and then they are worthy of receiving zakat as well. This is a modern fatwa, which you're not going to find in the classical books because the standards of living have gone so high and the price of silver has gone so low, right? Once upon a time, if you had 200 mithqal of silver, then you were pretty okay. But 200 mithqal of silver, silver is not worth much anymore. So if you take this into account then, inshallah this fatwa you will understand it. Uh, so zakat can be given to every Muslim. Now this is important, it has to be a Muslim. Uh, and you have to find somebody whom you feel to the best of your knowledge is worthy of zakat or you go to somebody who's trustworthy and who will do the job for you many islamic charities i'm not going to mention any by name because that's your business to do research the ones that you like many islamic charities they uh, have a separate zakat fund uh, and of course these days there are so many places around the world to give zakat to here at MIC, uh, we are also collecting zakat and we will, inshallah ta'ala, uh, depending on the amount that we get, we will decide where we, we, it will go. Last year, alhamdulillah, we got a very good amount. We gave all of that zakat. Uh, so this year as well, we will be collecting on your behalf. Uh, and therefore, you can speak to Brother Ali, Dr. Bashar, uh, and uh, you may give your checks to MIC, the zakat fund, and we will uh, cater to the needs of the ummah uh, as the shura, as the board sees fit, if you wish to do that. You may also give zakat to your family and your extended, uh, uh, your extended family. In fact, it is preferred to give zakat to your extended family. You may not give zakat to your mother and father or your son and daughter or your wife. As for the wife giving zakat to the husband, there's an ikhtilaf uh, and the majority say that if the husband has below the nisab and the wife has more than the nisab. And by the way, this was common once upon a time. Nowadays is different. Once upon a time, a woman might have inherited from her father, mashallah, tabarakallah, tens of thousands of dollars and the husband didn't have that much money. So she might have had a lot and the husband is less than the nisab. So majority of scholars would have allowed this. In our times, it's very rare that is the case, but technically it is allowed for the woman to give to the husband. Why? Because the sharia requires the husband to take care of the wife, not the other way around. So anybody, this is the rule, anybody you are obliged to take care of, you cannot give zakat to. This is the rule. Who must you take care of? Your mother, your father, your wife, your son, your daughter, your grandchildren, your grandparents, i.e. direct ascendant, direct descendant. These are wajib for you to take care of. Everybody else is not wajib. So an uncle, a cousin, a distant relative, if they are worthy of zakah, it is good, it is double reward to give them zakat. 
However, it is encouraged to give zakat locally as well. So it is good to give some zakat locally, some zakat to international causes, some zakat to your family. This is something that I think is very healthy. One third, let's say, locally for the local Muslims of Memphis. And there are plenty of refugee families. There are people in Memphis that are having a tough time uh, from the Muslim community, uh, people in legitimate debts, people who have, are having issues. Uh, go find them or ask your local community to help you find them. Give money to your relatives and also give money to uh, international causes. As Palestine and what's happening in Syria now and Kashmir, all of these places, there are much to give zakat on. The majority position, however, is that zakat must be given to individuals or to people who will give to individuals. You give it to us, we will give it to individuals. You cannot give zakat to build a hospital. You cannot give zakat to build an orphanage. You cannot build, give zakat to print the Quran. Zakat is given to the actual poor. So, you can give zakat to an orphan, but not to build an orphanage. You can give zakat to a medical patient who needs money to be cured, but you cannot give zakat to build a hospital. This is the majority position, and honestly, brothers and sisters, if you think about it, it is very logical, very uh, uh, watertight. If you allow to build a hospital with zakat, you're really opening up a can of worms. You really are. Zakat money is meant for those who desperately need it. And in Allah's wisdom, He closed the door for opening up a hospital or an orphanage. Because if you're going to build a hospital, you're going to have a luxury suite as well. You're going to have equipment worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, which not, might not be life-saving. You're going to have this, you're going to have that. In Allah's mercy, He just closed that door. You want to build a hospital? Use waqf, use sadaqah, but not zakah. You will get reward. Realize sadaqah is also encouraged in Islam, right? But zakat, which is the wajib, that must be given to a poor person. It must be given to somebody who literally is having difficult time living. So, this is the, the strongest position about uh, uh, giving zakat. It mu and this is, by the way, as well, uh, the World Fiqh Council as well. Uh, they have said that uh, it should be restricted to the poor, even though they allowed it for some small exceptions to organizations and corporations. The final point, what about haram money? Obviously, may Allah forgive us, but many of us, we do have haram. May Allah forgive us. We should realize that having haram money is a very, very severe crime. It is not just a crime against us, but much worse, it is a crime against our wife and our children. That on the day of judgment, they can complain to Allah that we fed them with haram money. And our Prophet ﷺ said that no body, no flesh that has been nourished with haram, with suhd, will enter Jannah. Haram money has many, many problems. We can give a khutbah about this. Uh, the dua will not be accepted, etc., etc. And what is haram money? Haram money is money that you get from bribes. Haram money is money that you steal. Haram money is money that you get from selling that which is filth, such as khamr, such as alcohol. Right? This is ummul khaba'id, the Prophet ﷺ said. Selling alcohol uh, is Allah's la'na, is on the one who sells alcohol and the one who buys alcohol. All of this is haram money. So, if we seek Allah's refuge, one of, and of course, let's be honest here as well, getting a profit on interest loans, this is also uh, haram money. You have a savings account. If you get any such haram money, and you cannot help it, for example, interest sometimes comes to you even if you don't want it. Many bank accounts, they force you to take interest. If this is the case, very easy, you simply get rid of that money and don't expect any reward from Allah. Suppose you get $1,000 interest at the end of the year, you write a check to $1,000, not zakat, not sadaqah. This is not even your money. It's literally as if you found money on the street, you picked it up, you gave it to a beggar right then and there. That khalas, here, take it. Better, better you use it. It's not your money to give. So don't expect any reward by giving it, but you should give it because it's not yours. Now, suppose you do have haram money, then the fact of the matter is, it is illogical, it is nonsensical to think of giving zakat on it. It's haram money, it's filth. If you do have it, my nasiha to myself and all of you, don't have it, get rid of it. If you do have it, it doesn't make any sense to calculate zakat upon it because this is in reality, it's not your money. It's literally as if you stole a thousand dollars from a rich person then gave five dollars to the poor, said here, and then you think Allah will reward you for that. No, you have a thousand dollars that you stole. Who cares if you gave five bucks to the poor? So haram money, there is no concept of zakat on that. Uh, every one of you should have a handout. Did you get it or not? I didn't see every. Every one of you has the handout? Yes? 
Uh, okay, if not, then inshallah, uh, there should be more outside available. Uh, and if they've run out, inshallah, we'll have them tomorrow. I know there's a lot of questions, uh, whatnot. I am here, alhamdulillah, at MIC. Tonight, any night you have any issues, uh, come to me or go to the scholar of your choice. In reality, this is a very detailed class. I summarized it in 40 minutes. Uh, go to the scholar of your choice and ask the fatwa from him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us purity in our wealth. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.